Christian Huber, who's speaking with us today, is professor in the Department of History of Art at the University of Michigan. She's also chair of the department uh, currently. Before coming to Michigan in 2011, she was assistant professor of art history at Indiana University in Bloomington. And she's also done visiting uh, stints in Paris at the Sorbonne and Humboldt University in Berlin in that time. Um, her primary field of research is Islamic book arts, as well as paintings of the Prophet Muhammad, and specifically images of ascension in Islamic arts. Um, and she's written three monographs related to these topics, three books. The Timurid Book of Ascension, Mi'rajnama, in 2008. The Ilkhanid Book of Ascension, in 2011. Uh, and just last year, the praiseworthy one, The Prophet Muhammad in Islamic Texts and Images from Indiana University Press. And she's edited and co-edited numerous books of essays uh, and collected volumes on these and other topics related to Islamic art and the representation of the Prophet Muhammad. And also done many other things, prepared exhibition catalogs and written dozens of articles and chapters in, both in scholarly venues and in the popular press. And so you may have, if you follow any of these issues in the popular press, you may have seen or listen to her. She's done interviews uh, for the BBC as well as Canadian CBC and NPR, plus in The Guardian numerous times and other media outlets. So she's uh, sort of on the hot on the circuit of, um, of these issues in the popular press and you can hear her voice regularly in lots of important places. So it's a real pleasure to have her here today. She teaches courses here at Michigan on visual cultures of Islam and her major courses, things like surveys of Islamic art, visual cultures of Islam, and seminars on, uh, on topics such as the image of the Prophet Muhammad in art and other things. Today she'll be speaking about Libya and her title is King of Kings of Africa, racializing Gaddafi in the visual output of the 2011 Libyan uprisings. So please join me in welcoming virtually uh, Professor Gruber. Thank you, go ahead, Christy. Thank you so much, Ryan, for the lovely introduction. And um, hello to everybody here on Zoom. It's a, a pleasure to see your faces streaming on my screen. It, it makes me feel a little less digitally remote from everything and everybody. So today, what I'd like to do is spend some time with you uh, just to talk through some of the, the visuals and the graffiti that came out during the Libyan revolution of 2011. Um, and as I think Ryan mentioned, I'd be very happy to uh, take questions and to have a discussion at the end of this talk. So please don't hesitate to, to speak up or to put any questions in the, the chat box. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, the title of uh, today's talk is King of Kings of Africa, Racializing Gaddafi in the Visual Output of the 2011 Libyan Revolution. So let me begin. Despite their vastly divergent characters and goals, the popular uprisings of the so-called Arab Spring of 2011 shared a number of common features, most especially the use of social and digital media as a means for mass communication and mobilization. In Cairo, Tehran, Tripoli, and beyond, demonstrators uh, staged rallies in the streets to call for the downfall of autocratic rulers and regimes, amplifying their voices with slogans and visuals to further their ideological messages. Battles were staged on the ground and in digital space through the creation of oppositional images in which the incumbent icons of state were mocked through caricature, beast allegories, anti-Semitic and Nazi coding, and other pictorial forms of humor falling all along the comedic spectrum from the lighthearted spoof to the biting invective. In Libya, markedly different pictorial forms of ridicule were unleashed in the public domain, however. Their chief target was Muammar al-Qadhafi, or just Qaddafi today, the so-called brother leader of the Libyan Arab Republic and the self-appointed King of Kings of Africa, a title that he adopted at a meeting of African rulers that he had himself convened in Benghazi in 2008. 
After failing to win the support from Arab governments, Gaddafi spent great efforts campaigning for African unity, fashioning himself as a traditional sub-Saharan African chieftain. His bombastic African title, his Afro-like hairdo, and his eye-catching robes made him an easy target for visual satire, which turned visibly more racist when he and his son Saif al-Islam resorted to using mercenaries drawn from sub-Saharan Africa to forcefully suppress the demonstrations. Throughout the Libyan uprisings, artists and cartoonists belonging to or sympathizing with oppositional groups reacted to these motifs and events by denigrating Gaddafi through a range of visu visual stereotypes, revealing that within the particular case of Libya, satirical contestations during the Arab Spring were not only transgressive and factional, but instrumentally racist as well. My presentation today seeks to explore the roles and modes of aesthetic forms of satire and racialized humor as they intersect with the visual culture of the 2011 Libyan revolution. During the uprisings, comic relief took on both merry and malicious forms, acting in essence as a much needed relief from tension while also aiding various social groups to communicate and to cohere by means of oppositional sentiment and imagery. A number of jokes and put downs involved the open complicity of numerous viewers. Insofar as shared laughter creates mutual participation in a social act, satirical images bear effective consequences by reinforcing antagonistic beliefs while also creating common attitudes and thus a more united community of feeling. When a particular community of feeling may hold racialized or even racist worldviews, it tends to promote and strengthen such stereotypes through repeated assertion, including through slogans, graffiti, and visual imagery. And those are the materials that I wish to explore with you today. As soon as protests broke out in Tripoli and Benghazi in February of 2011, caricatur uh, caricaturists hunkered down and set themselves to the task of producing satirical drawings and graphic images, and often with military precision and imagery and energy. Whether produced by pen, pencil, or computer graphics, these caricatures shared in their makers oppositional spirit and guerrilla modes of conflict humor. Like snipers shooting with bullseye accuracy, Libyan cartoonists belonging to various opposition groups unleashed their arsenal of images to strike at the central target of their collective ire, namely Muammar al-Qaddafi. Many posters were inked by hand and paraded in demonstrations held in the cities of Benghazi, the opposition stronghold, as well as in the capital of Tripoli, in particular the neighborhood of Fashnum, which was an opposition center. These visuals helped give an image to the protests, adding an iconography and hu of humiliation and annihilation to the repeated slogans and chants demanding Gaddafi's downfall and expulsion. In a number of posters and murals, Gaddafi was depicted with a pig's head and snout, or even a pig's body, with fleas buzzing around his frizzy hair, as well as a range of other animals such as dogs and rats. These beast allegories essentially pictured the Libyan ruler as a non or subhuman species. And here in this poster, you'll see that for those of you who know Arabic, the caption actually says without comment. So without caption, it speaks for itself. Over and again, Gaddafi was analogized to an irksome vermin. In one mural, for example, he's shown as a rat chomping on Emmentaler, Swiss cheese, 
while wearing a Chechea hat emblazoned with the Star of David. So here's our Chechea hat. It's basically a flat surfaced low level fez. Um, in some places it's also called a tarbush, so you might be familiar uh, with it. So here he has a Chechea hat emblazoned with the Star of David. While the savory snack may refer to the leader's $1 billion worth of assets siphoned off in an undeclared Swiss bank account, which was frozen during the uprisings, the six-pointed star appears to point to rumors that Gaddafi was supposedly a crypto Jew, rumors that circulated especially during the early days of the uprisings. More pointedly, here and elsewhere, the Star of David should be read as a visual symbol particular to resurgent anti-Semitism in both European and Islamic lands today. Other visual invectives, including a mural painted on a cement wall in Fashnum, again, the opposition stronghold in Tripoli, depict Gaddafi as a terror-stricken rodent on the verge of extinction. The pestilent little creature, topped with the sig signature Checheya and puffed out hair, dashes for safety, leaving a cloud of road running air behind it. Depicted at a point of suspense, this Qaddafi rat appears unlikely to escape the mouse trap, in which its tail is firmly held hostage, all the while as fumigation is sprayed its way. Here, the spray can, which you can see right here, is inscribed with the words 17 of February, which is the so-called day of rage, marking the beginning of popular demonstrations against Gaddafi in Libya. In addition, both the collective fist and the expelled chemical are tinted red, black, and green. So here we have red, black, and green, and the spray too is uh, tricolor. This chromatic symbolism or color symbolism points to Libya's tricolor flag that both antedates and postdates Gaddafi's rule in Libya, at which time a monochromatic green flag containing no heraldic devices whatsoever also functioned as a stand-in for Gaddafi's revolutionary manifesto known as the Green Book. So during Gaddafi's time, the flag of Libya was just plain green, the only state flag that was a plain color, and that was pointing to his, his so-called Green Book, his manifesto. Quite faithfully, this mural, which was recorded in April of 2011, foreshadows Gaddafi's final demise in October of the same year, when he was found hiding like a rat in a sewer, from which he was eventually extracted and killed. This was indeed an ironic end to the man who once dubbed Libyan rebels so-called rats that had to be chased from alley to alley. Besides animal allegories, a number of slogans were both exclaimed aloud and inscribed on, as graffiti on walls. For example, one popular rallying cry called for a free, free Libya, and Gaddafi has got to go. So for those of you who can read Arabic, you'll see that it rhymes. Libya hurra hurra wal Gaddafi batla barra. So it's a rhyming slogan saying, you know, Gaddafi has got to go and Libya has got to be made free. This rhyming chant provides just one example among many that came together to form the rich panoply of street poetics that flourished inside of Libya during the Arab Spring. As the scholar Eliot Kola has shown, these types of uh, slogans in essence serve as satirical invective performances that enabled members of the opposition groups to confront state regimes. And we see many slogans like this in Egypt, in Yemen, in Syria, and other places. These types of oral proclamations and insults help to delineate clearer lines of conflict within an otherwise ambiguous or complex social and political network of actors. Moreover, the undergirding provocative ethos 
which is expressed here in image making, slogans, and even poetry, mocks the embodiments of oppressive authority through both image and word production. As a consequence, opponents use invective as a strategy of political resistance while concurrently gaining a sense of superiority by humiliating, bullying, or ragging on their adversaries. This is particularly the case for individuals from within an oppressed or minority group who in turn, uh, who turn to using satire and humor to essentially externalize their fears and emotions, thereby helping them to regain control of their destiny, that is, to become powerful, proactive agents in a situation of perceived impotence. Many Liby Libyan slogans were not left unmediated. Instead, their locutionary force engendered visual icons in which a new and free Libya was collectivized as a tricolor flag or even a muscular fist. At times, the united flag and fist are shown to throw a Herculean punch against Gaddafi, whose nefariousness is demarcated not by the Star of David, but rather a swastika, as you can see right here on his Checheya. So his hat is inscribed with a swastika and not the Star of David this time. This here is an idle shuffling of Jewish and Nazi symbolism that points to the rather assorted and at times highly conflicting discourses that were adopted by various members of the opposition. Also noteworthy in these murals is the fact that the cement wall seems to carry a life force of its own. The barrier's sanguinity in this particular image is made manifest by Gaddafi's bloodshot eye as well as the blood pouring out from his nose and mouth. So I hope you can see uh, the blood here uh, and the blood here. So it's, it's almost as if this mural has the capacity to bleed. Seemingly immovable and yet reducible to rubble, the cement wall serves as a deft metaphor for this Libyan brother leader who despite a long lasting and hard headed grip on power, was nevertheless made of flesh and blood, and thus was vulnerable to collapse upon a punishing offensive. Not infrequently, street artists indeed treat their cement surfaces in a manner that reveals how visual images are considered animate entities that can exert their own energetic power. That is, even a cement wall could seem like it has a life of its own. Mobilizing its target viewing public into action, as well as sustaining a combative spirit, this punchy picture's intensity arises from its internal blood-infused energy and stamina. In an ironic twist, the mural is also rather funny in light of the fact that cement walls do not and cannot bleed. In conflict humor, the successful comedian like the one who maybe painted this picture, quote unquote, kills his enemy by putting the spotlight on his opponent's deformities, hypocrisies, and fallacies. And in English, we would refer to that as a killer joke. There's a reason why a really good joke is called a killer joke. It assassinates the antagonist. Emerging triumphant from this performance, the comedian thus feels a kind of sudden glory. According to Hobbes, the laughter that results from this so-called sudden glory is caused, quote unquote, by the apprehension of some deformed thing in another individual by comparison whereof the mockers suddenly can applaud themselves, end quote. Comedic victors thus may feel release from their war-won anxieties and then relish in the fact that they come out of this in a superior standing. So it's a way of elevating your status. Such expulsive rhetoric and imagery are hallmarks of conflict humor. In the Libyan revolutionary context, the visual punching bag is none other than Gaddafi, who is often shown 
as a trapped rat, evil incarnate and trammeled, and even refuse plunged into the gutters of history. So for example, here I show you a mural of Gaddafi with a plunger sort of pushing him into the, the pit of history. And this is a mural that went up in the neighborhood of Tripoli known as Fashnum. And here is the name of Fashnum, the neighborhood in our tricolor flag. And Fashnum says, welcome to you. So this is a welcome to Fashnum with an expulsion of, of Gaddafi. So in a clever diversion of the leader's pervasive cult of self images, Gaddafi's likeness like this one no longer remains in his personal possession or under really tight control. Instead, his oversized portrait, which prior to the 2011 uprisings cultivated an iconography suggested of, of unfettered power and total surveillance, has been visually diverted and merrily disgraced, acting instead as a proxy war for those wishing to fight and play hard. In the wake of the uprising's initial successes, the impoverished district of Fashlum in Tripoli was covered with fresh murals. At that time, Fashlum came under opposition control, serving as a staging ground for anti Qaddafi protests and armed conflict with loyalist forces, so forces loyal to the Qaddafi regime. The clashes cost the lives of many young men. And so it is the opposition's local and collective efforts, which eventually culminated in the death of Qaddafi, that are memorialized in the walls of Fashlum. In a number of cases, muralists from the area aimed to show that they stood for the whole country via the emblem of a rifle. So for example, here is the word Fashlum, which looks bullet ridden, with the M of Fashlum transforming into a rifle that's pointed at the head of Gaddafi. So they point their rifle to Gaddafi, but they also reassert the tricolor flag, heart and collective fist of Libya. At times the tricolor fist eradicates a Gaddafi that appears as if a weed or a spud, perhaps even a broccoli judging from the overly wrought florets of his curly hair. So you'll notice that Gaddafi here is kind of like a, a, a root vegetable. We've got our roots down here and his hair looks very much like, like broccoli or spud of some sorts. Equating Gaddafi to a root vegetable that must be deracinated from the soil is certainly a witty form of horticultural humor. However, in this mural, as well as in other visuals and even stuffed effigies, and you can see a stuffed effigy here in the lower left that were carried in the streets by the Libyan opposition, we cannot help but notice a more malicious form of caricature. In these varied images, Gaddafi bears exaggerated thick red lips, a large flattened nose, and hair that is not curly per se, but rather an afro in the more narrow sense of the term. In April 2011, the journalist John, uh, John Rosenthal visited Libya and was shocked by these ubiqu ubiquitous representations of what he called an afro Qaddafi, especially in the city of Benghazi. He hypothesized that these visuals suggest that the association of Qaddafi with Black Africa and Black Africans comprised one of, or of two, the two major ideological tricks of the rebellion. Not elaborating much further in his blog, Rosenthal came to the conclusion that such images must be considered racist. Since then, these so-called Afro-Qaddafi representations have not engendered all that much scrutiny discussion and debate. However, these types of images deserve to be carefully explored in terms of their iconography, relationship to racial tensions within Libya, and the role of racialized images within the construction of oppositional humor in this particular conflict setting. 
these interrelated three themes highlight the aesthetic modes and goals of racialized visual satire as it was uh, systemically cultivated in Libya during the so-called Arab Spring. So let's take a closer look at these. At the top of the list of racialized motifs comes Gaddafi's hairdo. Already before the uprisings, Libyans referred to the leader's puffy hairdo as a shafshufa, an Arabic colloquial term bearing various connotations. In the broadest sense, shafshufa means crazy, messy, or frizzy hair. It also signifies an Afro-like hairdo, as well as hair filled with lice or nits, both of which carry the racist connotation of poor hygiene and even an infestation. As one muralist interviewed by CNN in April of 2011 further clarified, the term shafshufa also means lack of disorder, in other words, chaos, chaotic hair. Therefore, Gaddafi's shafshufa should be understood as a capillary metaphor of the instability of the Gaddafi regime as well as the uncombed or disorganized chaos that spread throughout Libya over the course of 2011. During the uprisings, Gaddafi was definitely ridiculed for his curly cues. The diminutive name Shafshufa and Bushafshufa frequently used in oppositional slogans instead of his proper name or his more lofty epithets, such as colonel, brother leader, or even more lofty, leader of the revolution. The most frequently repeated slogans exclaimed, for example, Chef Shufa in Gala, right here, which means frizzy head, sorry, or frizzy head, what a shame, what a pity. In other words, you're going to be defeated. So that was one popular slogan. A second popular slogan, was a shafshufa emgala, our second slogan here, which means frizzy head has got nits. And another slogan, the third slogan, is Khadafi yabu shafshufa shab alibi tawat shufa, which is Libyan uh, Arabic colloquial, and it translates as Qaddafi of the frizzy hair, now you will reckon with the people of Libya. You'll have to see them. You'll have to come face to face with them. By inverting his lofty honorific titles and using the term shafshufa in oral slogans and visual images, the Libyan opposition engaged in forms of humorous humiliation that included name calling and threats of physical harm. Now you'll have to reckon with us. In a very real sense, the public sphere was filled with assertive chants and images with battle-ready young men admonishing Bushaf Shufa and not the brother leader that a day of reckoning was indeed fast approaching. These slogans and images also inspired a number of songs in particular rap melodies, which themselves owe so much to the aesthetics of street poetry and the staking of ideological counter stances. As Teresa Martinez notes, rap is often a defiant performance that partakes in an oppositional culture crafted by an underclass or minority community facing systemic discrimination. Like other resistant practices, including political demonstrations, chants, and visual lampoons, rap essentially enables the destabilizing of a dominant paradigm. This shift in power dynamics can be tracked in Libyan revolutionary songs, including in one that's known as Gelatina, which means gelatin, composed by Fuad Gritli and featuring a brown sugar and Nader D. For those of you who want to listen to that rap, you can simply go to YouTube um, once the lecture is over and do a search for Gelatina and Gritli, and you'll see just how appealing that rap melody is. 
The song's lyrics, for their part, encourage free Libyans to hold their heads up high and celebrate their newfound freedom. Over and again, the lyrics also mock Gaddafi as Bushaf Shufa, thus breaking his charisma through harmonic encores. Last but not least, they also issue a number of direct warnings to the Libyan leader. leader. And here, for example, I take a few of the verses. Crazy man with your crazy hair, stay in your rotten tent. Sorry, sorry, but we don't want no crazy hair. Yo, Gaddafi, you lunatic, we've known Tripoli as our home. You can run, but you can't hide forever. We're going to get you soon. In the opposition's many images, slogans, and even songs like this rap type of song, the Shaf Shufa is equated with uncleanliness, lunacy, and the ravage, a savage abode of the desert, in which we are told that Gaddafi pitches a rotten tent. Accusations of purulence, of rottenness aside, Gaddafi was indeed well known for his extravagant tentage. He frequently used large fabric canopies as an attribute of sub-Saharan royal customs of granting audience, of receiving individuals into his royal presence. Most infamously, he attempted to pitch camp on the grounds of Donald Trump's estate when he stayed in New York City to deliver his address at the United Nations in 2009. So this is 11 years ago, well before Donald Trump uh, be became President of the United States. Gaddafi's tent performance in the United States was a studiously staged projection of his constructed African identity, which was further amplified by his frequent doning of traditional African crowns and robes that were often imprinted with the outline of the African continent. So if you take a look here, you'll see he's got a, a kind of scarf or ribbon a fabric wrapped around his shoulders and his chest, and the continent of Africa is outlined on this kind of uh, vestmental attribute. So it's, it's almost like he's standing for Africa in himself. While in New York in 2009, he wore a, such a robe, pinned a brooch of Africa to his chest, and was introduced to the United Nations Assembly as the president of the African Union and the King of Kings of Africa. While at the United Nations, Gaddafi shattered protocol by giving a rambling speech that stretched for over 90 minutes, so longer than my speech today. The long-winded soliloquy included patriarchal references to President, then President Obama as quote unquote, our son, that is, as a black man from Africa. Injected with a fair dose of venom, but mostly comprising rambling nonsense, Gaddafi's memorable performance transgressed the allotted 15 minutes by a long shot. Audience, audience members were at their wits end, as you probably can tell uh, from this posture right here. And yet, that was not all. Further shattering protocol in both delivery and timing Gaddafi gesticulated wildly. The hand-scribbled transcript of his speech visible to onlookers and photographers who relished in the fact that his speech was a nonsensical diatribe that proved a fitting match for its almost illegible counterpart. So if you look carefully here, this is basically a mishmash of almost illeg illegible notes right here. The photographers really enjoyed taking photographers of uh, uh, photographs of that speech, which is why we have these images today. In this diatribe, as well as in other speeches that he delivered in Tripoli during the 2011 Libyan uprisings, Gaddafi often appeared as if he were a pre-linguistic analphabet baboon babbling his way through mounds of verbiage while struggling to learn his ABCs along the way. As funny as it may seem to outside observers, for Gaddafi, however, the Shafshufa was serious business. As an ethnic coiffure, 
it functioned as a hair extension to his overwrought African persona. In fact, to give another example of this phenomenon, one need to, no fur to turn no further than Gaddafi's use of the superlative title, King of Kings of Africa, or Melik Muluk Ifrikia, an honorific title that was bestowed upon him at a 2008 summit of sub-Saharan African chiefs, which he hosted himself in Benghazi. In fact, scholars say that it wasn't really a title that was bestowed upon him, it was actually bestowed upon himself, um, kind of like a ruler might self-coronate or put the crown uh, on his own head. His hope for African Union was often promoted in these meetings, propaganda posters, and commemorative postcards. These related visuals often depict him as a godlike visionary, and in this case, a visionary sporting dark and somewhat suave shades, overseeing the diminutive continent, accompanied by the inscription boasting, in this case, that his grand dream is coming true. So his grand dream, of course, is African unity, uniting both North Africa, which is uh, Arab, with Sub-Saharan Africa, which is uh, non-Arab. In his self-appointed role as chief of chiefs, he found it necessary to adopt proper regalia, so royal attributes, including colorful robes, gold crowns, and ornate thrones, in accordance with traditional African paradigms, so not Islamic paradigms. Taken as a whole, the aesthetic that Gaddafi himself cultivated was that of an eccentric, opinionated, loquacious, so talkative, nomadic sub-Saharan African king. For his opponents, or for that matter, anyone enjoying a bit of humorous repartee, his wacky personas and exploits beckoned equally absurd responsorial satire. As an upturned response, cartoonists transformed Gaddafi's stately claims to Africanness by transforming him into a puffy lipped, flattened nosed, and frizzy haired self parody, whereby the Shafshufa, or this curly haired hairdo, served as a prime indexical mark of his constructed African identity, itself to be mocked rather than applauded. For the Libyan opposition, ridiculing these African tropes and embodiments was a relatively easy task given the operatic hyperbole with which they were established by Gaddafi in the first place. He created that vocabulary so the opposition could simply engage in it for themselves. This type of rhetorical and visual jesting proved a very effective weapon insofar as it helped to obliterate Gaddafi's self-proclaimed earnestness and his claims to power. These rival aesthetics of Africanness can be tracked in a number of other materials and milieus giving further credence to the interpretation of the Shafshufa as a visual spoof within a larger context of racialized conflict. As a case in point, official photographs of Gaddafi as the King of Kings of Africa were regularly mocked during the 2011 uprisings. Often the opposition manipulated and disseminated visuals in which his African position of authority became the subject of comedic diversion and even ethnic humor. For example, in one flyer that I'm showing you here that was photographed by CNN uh, in April of 2011, it is clear that Libyan aesthetics of belligerence, right, a sort of a militant belligerence, also involved a process of post-producing already existing images to overlay them with an overtly racialized form of humor trading in notions of blackness. Here, a photograph shows Gaddafi as a sub-Saharan leader seated under a green parasol or umbrella and encircled by the black female members of his family. 
Qaddafi's slightly paler face, which you can see uh, right here, hovers above his well-fed belly that is indicative of his regal status. So what I'm showing you here is a very strange visual concoction. And so the question has to be, what is this image and where is it coming from? Luckily, it doesn't take much research to identify the original image prior to its co-opting and photoshopping by the Libyan opposition. The original photograph shows Joseph Langofin, the reigning chief of the kingdom of Abomey, and his family in royal audience. This photograph in its original form right here on the, on the right was taken by uh, Daniel Lenné, who was a prize winning French photographer. The photograph itself forms part of a 1990 series that would became extremely well known. In fact, this series of photographs earned uh, Lenné the prestigious World Press Photo Prize in 1990, making them very available online and in print. The opposition thus drew upon and altered, they photoshopped, a prize-winning, well-disseminated photograph of an African king dressed in full regalia, full royal gear, enthroned under a parasol and surrounded by his female family members. Beyond mocking these African visual tropes through cut and paste techniques, the flyer also helps the viewer reach a satirical interpretation by means of the insertion of text. So let's take a look uh, at the text. You'll see that Arabic underneath the image. Below the post-produced photograph, three lines in Arabic record Qaddafi speaking directly to the viewer, asking him, who told you that I am in Venezuela? I am the king of kings of Africa. I am in my kingdom and a guest among my people on the island of Tuz Tuza. And this all rhymes in Arabic, end quote. The rhyming transcript appears to have been penned in response to Qaddafi's disappearance during the uprisings, at which time rumors flew that he had sought refuge with Hugo Chavez, the president of Venezuela. Dispelling the notion that the Libyan leader had crossed over the Atlantic, the opposition instead declares that this king of kings of Africa had remained in his kingdom, but the kingdom here is not called Libya, it's called Tuz Tuza. Funnily enough, in Libyan colloquial, the word Tuz means to break wind, and therefore Tuz Tuza is best translated, and forgive my French, as fart farta. Thus, through racialized visual diversion and potty mouth humor, Qaddafi is rendered as the African king of the Isle of Flatulence. This catalogical lampoon is rude and rambunctious, to say the least. Already before the uprisings, Qaddafi's Baroque looks earned him derision. However, it was his African titulature and chieftain's regalia that were especially mocked in the spring of 2011. These digital jokes adopt and subvert older regime-sponsored products, including postcards and posters of Qaddafi as the leader of the African Union. For the Libyan opposition, such regime-sponsored images were seen as further evidence of Qaddafi's egomaniacal delusions and questionable state of mind. More importantly, they also were to be mined, plundered in essence, in order to compose really acerbic, mordant commentary about his other actions, especially with regards to the Africa question and his various links to Africans south of the Sahara. Which brings us to the next topic, which is his link to sub-Saharan individuals or the so-called black man. 
During the Libyan uprisings, there circulated widespread reports, as well as physical and photographic evidence of the use of mercenaries drawn from Sub-Saharan Africa, who were directed by Gaddafi and his son Saif al-Islam to suppress street demonstrations and the armed opposition. Although there was press speculation that these soldiers were coming from Chad, the Congo, Niger, Mali, Sudan, Zimbabwe, and Liberia, it appears that the majority of these mercenaries were either Tuareg soldiers from Northern Mali or else Tuareg soldiers who had already been present in Libya's military forces already well before the 2011 uprisings. While some Tuareg soldiers may have been lured by the prospect of financial gain, others may have felt indebted to Gaddafi for his help in bringing to an end the 2009 Tuareg rebellion in both Mali and Niger. Whatever the case may be, during the 2011 Libyan clashes, there were many reports of these mercenaries using heavy weapons, including anti-aircraft missiles, helicopter gunships, Molotov cocktails, rifles, and even antique sabers to kill scores of protesters, many of whose bodies were found in the streets riddled by heavy machine gunfire. Benghazi residents, these are the Arab residents of Benghazi, were reported as saying that the so-called quote-unquote dark-skinned soldiers, wherever they were coming from, did not speak Arabic, making it impossible to quote-unquote reason with them once they were captured. In other cases, and this is to show you the other side of the equation, African men were caught in the conflict, they were caught in between, and when they were suspected of doing Gaddafi's bidding, they were reportedly subjected to absolutely horrific acts of torture undertaken by members of the opposition. So the violence went both ways. Here then, real events merged with racial stereotyping, with violence most likely committed by both sides of the conflict. However, insofar as images of the African man, and that is in quotes, are concerned, the opposition's agenda was rather unified and clear, namely that Gaddafi's vicious militias were populated by quote unquote dark skinned men who were perceived as anthropoid killing machines with no detectable capacity for speech or logic. That was the image that was cultivated by the opposition when it came to the question of the so-called uh, African man. So it was all crafted through images and slogans in this way. Members of the opposition reacted to these aggressors as if they were boogeymen, an amorphous collective spreading terror and death in Libyan towns. Moreover, they systematically aligned the image of these black men to the sub-Saharan monkey, drawing upon a number of deeply racist stereotypes and epithets. And that brings me to our last topic, which is the monkey or the ape. These ape metaphors and rhetoric similarly were applied to Gaddafi and his son Saif al-Islam, who himself supported Tuareg warriors, and in the aftermath of the Libyan revolution, even took refuge with them in the borderlands between Libya and Niger until his capture in October of 2011. With his many contrived uh, ties to Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as his close association with black mercenaries analogized to monkeys, Gaddafi thus gained another image and title, namely that of the ape. As a consequence, Gaddafi is frequently depicted in oppositional posters and murals as a human-headed simian, either dangling from a banana tree or else it eating lice or nits off of his monkey progeny, Saif al-Islam. Often such visuals also included Gaddafi's lofty title 
Melik Muluk Ifrikia, or King of Kings of Africa, diverted into a new racialized title, namely Monkey of Monkeys of Africa. So here it is the new title, Kird Kurud Ifrikia. No longer is Gaddafi this amazing King of Kings of Africa. He's now the Monkey of Monkeys of Africa, and he's shown as if a monkey dangling from a tree and eating a banana in this case. But that's not all. It gets worse. In the Libyan uprisings, the symbolic crushing of Gaddafi's authority occurred through the exploitation of slogans and debasing of lofty titles, as well as through these Afro-ape analogies. While these stratagems were common and widespread, the most important creator of Gaddafi monkey imagery was Qais al-Hilali, a highly productive creator of Gaddafi monkey imagery and a, excuse me, a highly productive and respected political cartoonist. So here is his name, Qais al-Hilali. Qais al-Hilali worked for the opposition in Benghazi until he was shot and killed by loyalist forces in March 2011 no doubt as revenge for his brazen visual attacks on the so-called King of Kings of Africa. So it's because of this imagery that a cartoonist, Faisal Hilali, was in fact shot dead. Several of Hilali's cartoons, including one showing a monkey Gaddafi, Gaddafi squatting on the ground while eating fleas off the back of his son Saif al-Islam, multiplied across the media and appeared in several cities in, Lib in Libya, including in the murals painted in Tripoli and Benghazi. So for example, here is our monkey Gaddafi eating lice off of his monkey son, Saif al-Islam. And instead of Malik Muluk or King of Kings, here we see Kirt Kuruts or monkey of monkeys. And here's Gaddafi as a, as a kind of de devil with a trident sort of poking at Africa. And here is another one of these basic images of Gaddafi and his son as uh, an ape duo. And once again, this is signed by Kays al-Hilali um, and it says here without comment. So the image is supposed to speak for itself. In his wall paintings in Benghazi, another muralist by the name of Ibrahim Hamid who was also an engineering student that was nicknamed at the time Benghazi's Banksy, Banksy being a very famous mural artist, depicted Gaddafi in various ways. So for example, here we have Gaddafi, let's see if my pointer come, come here, Gaddafi being checkmated. Here is Gaddafi as a wanted poster. In the back, you can barely see it. This is Gaddafi holding uh, the people of Libya hostage with a chain, and the yoke is actually his green book. Here, this is a large hand picking Gaddafi up by the hair and about to chuck it into the trash bin of history. And this is the mural I showed just previously with uh, the monkey duo. And I'm going to zoom in on that particular detail now. These types of images surely were seen as too appealing to the opposition and too threatening to the regime, which was desperately struggling to maintain an image of power, control, and authority inside the country at this time. Although Ibrahim Hamid, who painted this mural, remains alive, Qais al-Hilali was violently assassinated. This particular episode painfully highlights the fact that humor in conflict does not just heighten hostilities or else serve as a training ground for future conflicts, sort of uniting people into oppositional groups. Much more seriously, it is warfare in and of itself, and it carries real life consequences for fighters and cartoonists shooting at each other with both heavy weapons and cutting edge wit. So now to conclude, in these many slogans and visuals, Gaddafi is either described or depicted as a monkey, creating an incongruous image wherein the viewer is forced into a series of conceptual shifts. These shifts of mental patterns 
that seek to process conflicting schemas are what humor theorists call bisociation, at which time a perceiving subject, such as us, people who are looking at these images, are faced with two self-consistent but incompatible frames of reference. This ambiguity between the human and the monkey in turn causes a cognitive operation that is referred to as vibrating or flickering, in this case an oscillation between the viewer's concurrent perception of a human and a monkey. Such visual incongruities yield what we might call a metamorphic aesthetic, an, an, an aesthetic of metamorphosis. And in this specific aesthetic, revels in stereotypes that, although racialized, nevertheless become visually enjoyable when they're couched in a framework of recreation. As a consequence, those who circulate racist jokes, and including racist visual jokes, um, and images tend to play with exaggeration, thereby converting morally objectionable ideas into enjoyable experiences. Indeed, as the humor theorist John Moriel underscores, quote, putting a play frame around stereotypes inside a joke can aestheticize them, and it removes them at least temporarily from moral scrutiny. In other words, you can say something absolutely atrocious if you couch it as a joke. By far and large, oppositional images produced during the Libyan uprisings denigrate and demonize Gaddafi through the use of satirical zoo, zoomorphism, so you know, anthropomorphisms that uh, unleash uh, animals, whether it's the rat, the dog, the monkey, or the pig. And they also make a lavish use of racist stereotypes. These combinatory aesthetics argue for Qaddafi's status as a kind of in-between species, violating the viewer's conceptual taxonomies while simultaneously turning the viewer, turning us into accomplices in the astringent enjoyment of malice. In other words, we're complicit in this malice. These racialized forms of humor therefore highlight the fact that aesthetics involve not only the investigation of the nature of beauty, but also the study of sensorial and emotional values as they intersect with ethics. So we have both, both aesthetics and ethics that really have to conjoin in these really fraught and difficult combinatory images. Alluring yet caustic, these incongruous images certainly violate our mental patterns and they contradict the dictates of political correctness. Last but certainly not least, humor must also be conceived of as an aesthetic experience because it involves playful imagination, creative devices, and these are nothing uh, but creative devices, and incongruous images that are produced by a range of verbal and visual tricks. By activating our creative uh, faculty, our imagination, um, in, our, in, the, in our viewers, or in the viewers, both comedian and artist engage in playful social acts that in essence stimulate the mind as it decodes and delights in ambiguity and originality even if these cognitive and visual pleasures are born in a conflict context and hence are aggressive, vindictive, or even racist in character. As a result, conflict images, including satirical images of Muammar Gaddafi, often seek to yoke unlikes, to put two things that are not the same together, such as monkey and ape. And they also seek to couple pain with pleasure. What's more, they also remind their viewers that if they are to fight and die, then they might as well die laughing. Thank you very much.